47 minutes and 30 seconds left in this particular hold. Launch controllers are still not working any problems that would prevent us from a lifting off at 5.02 p.m. Eastern. That being the case, we have brought in Discovery's flow director, Stephanie Stilson, to join us to uh, walk us through how we got to where we are now. Stephanie, sure. thank you for joining us. Sure thing. So how did we get to where we are now? A lot of hard work by a lot of people, that's for sure. We've had a really good flow this time around. Um, it's been a very clean flow, and that's reflected in how things are looking right now in the countdown. And as a matter of fact, uh, we were hearing from uh, even Mark Kelly, commander of Discovery, was uh, saying that, yeah, we were near a historic low, which always makes me nervous when people say <laughs> things like that. But, so You and me both. <laughs> on hardware issues. So where are we? Yes, um, right now we, we track our problems with what we call interim problem reports, IPRs. And right now we're at count number 73, and the record is actually 76 for the low. And that was actually a discovery flight as well, SGS 105. So uh, we're hoping that we keep going the way we are now, that maybe we'll break that record. That would be a great thing. Like you said, we haven't quite lifted off yet. so it's <laughs> Got a little um, more time. Why don't we um, – I know you have some uh, – Video to show everybody to walk through exactly what, uh, where, where, where we came from and how we're out at the launch pad. Yes, so. yes, we'd like to do that. That'd be great. Okay, on March 26, external tank 128 arrived by barge from the Michoud Assembly Facility in Louisiana. After spending a week traveling through the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean, the barge is carefully negotiated into the Kennedy Space Center turn basin. The turn basin is located less than a quarter of a mile from the vehicle assembly building, which is the tank's first stop upon arrival at KSC. Once on dock, we use the external tank transporter to move the tank off the barge and over to the vehicle assembly building. This process takes us approximately two hours. The function of the tank is to provide propellants to the three space shuttle main engines. The tank is 154 feet long, 27 and a half feet in diameter, and holds over 500,000 gallons of propellant. Once the tank is located in the vehicle assembly building, we attach the sling and start the process of lifting the tank into the test and checkout cell. This is done using a 325-ton and 175-ton crane. The tank weighs over 58,000 pounds empty, and it takes approximately 12 hours to place the tank in the checkout cell. Once in the checkout cell, the tank is inspected and prepared for being mated to the solid rocket boosters. While all of this is happening in the vehicle assembly building, the orbiter is being readied in the orbiter processing facility. The majority of the required repairs, modifications, and system testing occurs in the OPF. Here you can see the payload bay of the orbiter with the orbiter docking system on the left. And as the camera pans towards the aft of the orbiter, you can see the remote manipulator system, or the shuttle arm, in the forefront with the red protective covers that are removed before flight. These technicians are performing tile work on the orbiter and are specifically working a closeout panel located between the belly of the orbiter and the reinforced carbon-carbon panels of the wing leaning edge. When all the work in the payload bay is complete, we close the payload bay doors. Here you can see the silver radiators which line the interior of the doors. The radiators provide cooling for the electronic boxes that control all of the orbiter systems. The door being closed in this phase is the left hand or port door. Before closing the right hand door, we have to retract and stow the KU band antenna, which is one of the antennas that allows the astronauts to communicate with the team in the mission control while on orbit. The motors that drive the movement of the payload bay doors are designed to work in microgravity and are therefore not strong enough to close the doors here on Earth. So we have what is called a zero gravity or zero G system to assist the doors with the closure while being carefully monitored. The yellow structure that you see here is part of that zero G system. Prior to the arrival of the tank, the solid rocket booster segments are stacked on the mobile launch platform in the vehicle assembly building. The solid rocket boosters augment the thrust of the space shuttle main engines during the first stage of flight. Once stacking of the boosters is complete and the tank has been checked out, we begin the process of moving the tank from the test and checkout cell to the integration cell to be mated to the boosters. The 325-ton crane lowers the tank down into position so that it can be bolted to the solid rocket boosters. We have technicians located on platforms around the boosters monitoring the lowering process to ensure the tank is in the exact position required. Once the external tank is mated to the solid rocket boosters, we spend about two weeks doing closeouts in preparation for the arrival of the orbiter. Similar to the tank transporter we saw earlier, the orbiter has a transporter as well. The orbiter transport system, or OTS, has 76 wheels on 19 axles and was built specifically for the orbiter. Once all the test and checkout of the orbiter is complete, we position the transporter underneath the orbiter. Discovery is then lowered onto the transporter. When secured, the OTS slowly backs out of the orbiter processing facility to make the 30-minute trip to the vehicle assembly building. The transporter can travel 12 miles per hour when it's not carrying an orbiter, but only 2 miles per hour with an orbiter. Discovery is attached to the transporter using the same attach points that will eventually connect it to the external tank. 
The orbiter is 122 feet long with a 78-foot wingspan and weighs approximately 200,000 pounds. There are approximately 24,000 tile and over 3,000 thermal blankets on discovery to protect the orbiter from the extreme temperature fluctuations seen on orbit and during reentry. SGS-124 will be the 123rd space shuttle flight and Discovery's 35th flight. Discovery spent 170 days in the orbiter processing facility preparing for the task of delivering the pressurized module component of the Japanese experiment module to the International Space Station. The pressurized module is so large that it practically fills the entire payload bay itself. In fact, because of the module's size, we are not able to carry the orbiter boom, which is an extension of the shuttle arm, with us during this flight. Instead, Endeavour left a boom for us at the International Space Station during their last mission. Once the pressurized module is removed from Discovery's payload bay, we will pick up the boom, use it during the mission, and bring it back to Earth. Once Discovery is safely in the Vehicle Assembly Building, we begin the process of lifting the orbiter off the transporter so that it can eventually be attached to the external tank. A sling is connected to the orbiter, which allows cranes to lift and move Discovery into the vertical position. Once in this position, we can then begin the process of lifting the orbiter up and over the transom into the integration cell. It takes approximately 12 hours to lift the orbiter and get it into the mate position. Technicians closely monitor the movement of the orbiter and are in radio contact with the crane operators at all times. The Vehicle Assembly Building was originally built for the Apollo program in the 1960s and was later modified to accommodate the space shuttle. It is 525 feet tall, which is large enough to house the Statue of Liberty, and it covers eight acres in floor space. Once in place, the orbiter is bolted to the external tank and three attach points that use frangible nuts. During launch, when the main engines have depleted all the fuel in the tank, pyrotechnics are detonated, which break the nuts, allowing the tank to separate from the orbiter and disintegrate as it falls through the atmosphere. Once the orbiters attach the external tank, we begin the process of retracting access platforms in preparation for moving the complete shuttle stack out to the launch pad. On April 29th, Discovery began the approximately three-mile journey from the Vehicle Assembly Building to Pad A. The stack is moved by one of our two crawler transporters. Instead of wheels, the crawler has eight tracks with 57 cleats per track. Each cleat weighs one ton. The transporter is 131 feet long by 114 feet wide, which is comparable in size to the infield of a regulation baseball field. The crawler weighs 6 million pounds and uses 150 gallons of diesel fuel per mile as it travels down a gravel path out to the launch pad. At a speed of less than one mile per hour, it takes approximately eight hours to travel just over three miles from the vehicle assembly building to the launch pad. Once at the launch pad, we spend about a month doing full system checkout of the tank, boosters, and orbiter in preparation for today's mission. Get a couple of nice shots of of discovery there when you run out to the launch pad. And as a matter of fact, um, something I guess has to do directly with the number of problems you had, or lack of problems. Lack of you problems. Had, Let's actually. say it that way. That's a much better <laughs> That's way. That's a to much say better it. way. <laughs> Good public affairs. Um, it. We started off uh, pretty much with no. We like to call them contingency days. That's what we refer to them. But they're it's padding in the schedule that gives us if something crops up, mm -hmm. it gives us a chance to work it and not affect the overall. Uh, launch schedule. Mm -hmm. um, you started off with zero. And Actually, we started off with seven going seven. into integrated flow. So we did have seven, and we ended up using two, which got us down to, to five, which actually going into the integrated flow, I'd be very content with just having five. So even when we came down to five, that's still plenty of time, and we ended up not even having to use those five days. So that allowed us to actually take off the, the holiday weekend, which was a great thing for all the folks right before countdown to have a three-day weekend. And um, yes, as you said, that can be attributed to, to the great processing flow up to that point, and uh, the vehicles just behaving wonderfully, so we haven't had a lot of issues to have to deal with. And that is all good news because it puts us in a good position to be able to launch today if weather cooperates, which it looks like it will, and, and our, our transatlantic abort sites, they uh, continue to have good weather. Yeah, we can't control the weather. That's the one thing we can't control. And that's another part of the government, I know, does, does weather modification. All right, well, Stephanie, thank you for joining us and really uh, walking us through how we got to, uh, out to the launch pad. And uh, well, our fingers and every other appendage we can will be crossed for a good launch today. Not anything you can do, that's great. We want to get off today. It'd be a wonderful day to launch. So we're here at uh, T-minus three hours in holding. This is Shuttle Launch Control.